Hello, my friends. Welcome to another amazing, fantastic episode of God Side Hustle. I'm your host, Chris McPeak. And today we are talking with my new fellow Gen X friend, Matt Franklin. He hosts the Rogue Retirement Lounge. That is such a, a hot podcast name. Matt, how are you doing today? I'm awesome, Chris. How are you doing? I'm outstanding. And thank you for carving time to be on the show today. I am well, thanks for. Forward- Thanks for having me. Yeah, totally. I love meeting podcasters. You know, why I take the first Tuesday of every month off <laughs> from my day okay. job. You have some fantastic side hustle stories. And I sort of thought today we would just, we'd spend some hangout time talking about your side hustle stories. We can just sort of have our own little fireside chat. Um, Cause I'm particularly interested about the shark tank story. That was like the first thing that you said before we started recording. And of course my brain went ding. So, um, yeah, well, first let's tell people uh, who you are, what you do and, um, yeah, who you serve. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my name is Matt Franklin. I live in, uh, sunny Portland, Oregon. Uh, I have a podcast called the rogue retirement lounge, and that's where I talk to entrepreneurs about retirement planning. And I started the podcast because entrepreneurs are terrible at retirement planning. <laughs> and, um, I've been, uh, self-employed for 15 years, a little awesome. over 15 years. And, um, yeah, midway into my, uh, self-employment journey, I realized, Hey, I'm not saving enough for retirement. Like I was back when I had a job and a 401k. Yeah. And that's what kind of led me to to where I am now being a podcaster, but my normal kind of day business that I have is I, I have a video production business that I do full time. Oh, cool. Okay. Awesome. So the, this, the podcast is sort of a side hustle for you at this stage. It is. It's one of, one of a few. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, let's talk about the, um, let's talk about first what, like, what caused you to decide you wanted to have a, a podcast? Uh, a, well, the, the, the podcast was just as a, a uh, result of me spending all my time, my spare time obsessing about investing. I got yeah. into real estate investing. I got into, I started getting afraid of the stock market. So I, I sold all my stock and started buying houses and buying oh. into apartment syndications. And then, then that led me to, you know, l- listening to podcasts about retirement and mm-hmm. about brain health and longevity. And, and oh, so wow. I, I became kind of obsessed with this whole world, but it, none of it served the entrepreneurs. And I since see. I'm an entrepreneur, it, you know, so many people were talking about, oh, you gotta, you know, when take your, your 401k and put it into target date funds when you're over 50. And I'm like, well, sorry, I don't have a 401k. I can't, you know, and all these, all these things that are kind of directed at normal employed people. Right. So that because <laughs> I felt that uh, entrepreneurs were kind of underserved as far as retirement planning, that's what made me decide to make my podcast. Oh, I love that. That's very, very clever. And, and you said you've been self-employed for 15 years doing yeah. a video production business. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, cool. So let's just dig right into the shark tank story. Cause now that's in my brain. So <laughs> okay. um, how did you wind up on that show and what were you, what did you pitch? I actually okay. have never watched the show before, but I do know the premise. So, okay. Well, um, it, it's, <laughs> it's worth watching. It becomes very formulaic now that they're in like season 12. It's, okay. it's a lot of kind of the same thing, but if you're into entrepreneurship, it's, it's fun to watch. It's fun yeah. to see people's ideas and kind of what led them to, to where they were. Um, but what got me there, it, it started out, I was uh, in 2009, I was doing, I had my own business and I was doing some editing, some video editing for a client of mine. Okay. And um, they were a fortune 1000 tech company and they, they had me on site uh, editing for like eight or 10 hours a day wow. for a couple of weeks in a row, but they put me in a supply closet. So literally I was in a windowless eight by eight supply closet with dry erase markers and reams of paper (laughs) and no windows. And so I sat there and I called up a buddy of mine who lives in New York. And I said, dude, we got to make an infomercial. And this was my first uh, whole thought of a side hustle. And I said, I have a video production company. I can make infomercials. And this was the time when the sham wow was like the, I don't know if you remember the sham wow. Yeah. I remember the sham wow. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So I thought, well, if that turd can get rich selling chamois cloths, I thought we could, we could figure out something. So my buddy in New York, he said, well, I've got an idea for a posture correction device. I said, okay, great. Let's talk about it. And let's meet in Chicago this weekend and let's, let's prototype one. So he flies to Chicago. I fly to Chicago. We sit there, we have the elastic and uh, Velcro and we start trying to build a prototype and we kind of, 
Yeah. And, and sh long story short or short story long, uh, after that weekend, we had a drawing. I went home and I started contacting uh, manufacturers in China because wow. I had no idea how you do this. I didn't know how to create a product. And it was literally a kind of a posture correction device. And so I reached out to a bunch of Chinese manufacturers, sent them the drawing, asking for samples. I got a few samples back and I had to pay, you know, various amounts anywhere from just shipping to like a couple of hundred bucks for samples. And then next thing you know, I got a really good one. We did a couple of refinements and then we made our first order. We built a website and within... Uh, within nine months of that trip to Chicago, we had a live website and we sold our first product. Wow, that's impressive. Yeah, it was it was kind of a learning by doing and uh, uh, kind of ready fire aim. And if we would have done our market research and if we would have done our due diligence, we probably wouldn't have done it. Yeah, and um, we would have said uh, this is a stupid idea. And then uh, next thing you know, about uh, two two years into the business. Uh, we got chosen to be on Shark Tank, and oh. um, and then then things kind of went crazy from there. Crazy good or crazy bad? Crazy good. Well, a actually, oh, wow. at the Shark Tank, um, the going to be on Shark Tank was kind of terrifying, and we did we did horribly. I mean, my <laughs> we we were hungover. My <laughs> business partner was had a bunch of canned stupid responses like ready that he hadn't told me about. So he had all these like one liners and it was interrupting me and interrupting the sharks. Oh, and no. it was, it, it was a disaster. But um, what happens when you're on shark tank and 7 million people see your product, all of a sudden sales go nuts. Yeah. And so we sold just a ton of these silly wow. posture correctors after. And it was funny because you, you watch the show and I, I know you haven't seen it, but um when, as a business person who's got a, a business on the show, and if you've got a website, I don't know if you've ever seen Google Analytics real time. No. But well, real time analytics shows a map uh -huh. and it shows all the places on the map where you have visitors from. Oh, wow. So, so this show aired at, um, uh, at our local time of five, but eight o'clock on the East Coast. Okay. So we're sitting here, we're not watching it, we're in the office and it's, it, the show is on and then our segment comes on and all of a sudden we're looking at Google Analytics and it looks like a nuclear war on the East Coast. Oh, it, wow. We, yeah, it was crazy. And then all the orders come in and it's like you hit refresh on your, your email and all of a sudden there's 20 orders, 20 orders. Oh my gosh. And yeah, so it was a very exciting, cool experience. That's and we sold Cool. just a ton yeah and so do you still produce those is that still a thing or it, it is still a thing but both of us as soon as the first couple of years of of craziness kind of wore off or actually within months we all we we kind of just went off and did other things okay I did a couple of kickstarters um, I invented other products. And so it now is kind of on autopilot. It, we, you know, we sell a few, but it, we don't make a living from it anymore. Yeah. Got it. So it's out there. It's evergreen, but it's not like your main. Exactly. Person. Got it. Yeah. So the, tell me about the, um, the other products you've invented. Cause that's, that's kind of cool. Well, um, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I would consider myself a pretty good inventor, but a terrible business person. So <laughs> I, I came up with, uh, with a, another buddy of mine, we came up with this golf instruction package that was amazing. We, and we spent literally two or two or three years developing wow. this thing. And as soon as we got it produced, because it had, it had both software and hardware, and I had to write a bunch of web stuff. And it was like, you, you'd get this kit and it, could have been huge, but as soon as we got the thousand, you know, packages sent to us, we were both on to other things. Okay. Because neither of us wanted to sell. So right. like, and then we, so then I, I co-invented these, these glasses that help you uh, read without having to look down. Um, oh. uh and we, we developed a phone stand that has this neodymium magnet so that you can, you know, put your phone and take selfies like anywhere if you're out traveling. Oh, cool. Um, and none of these, uh, we've had a successful Kickstarter with the phone stand. But the problem is, is that, again, I'm pretty good at developing a product and finding manufacturers. But then as soon as I've got it, 
I just, I, I yeah, have like, the, yeah, I'm just the rabbit. I'm chasing rabbits down the, to the next thing. Yeah. So. so have you ever taken any of your products to trade shows, anything like that? Nope. Nope. I just, I bring it up because my, my hubby and I have a friend that lives in the Inland Empire and he invented something called a dig ender. And uh, it was to, to um, dig post post holes if you're like building fences and stuff but okay. he took that to the national hardware show to to try to get somebody to you know buy into it um and i just i mentioned that because i don't know that he's trying to produce dig enders anymore um but that just made me think like well if you've invented these products like did you ever go to trade shows to try to yeah we we, we never we never did and and again it's 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 i've met some inventors because one thing that does happen when you're on shark tank is people start coming to you and asking for your advice oh, and sharing yeah. war stories and just, you know, seeking like, Hey, where did you find this? Where did, what did you do for your shipping? What do you do for that? Right. And I've met a ton of inventors who are very good at following through mm -hmm. who, who do take their side hustle and, and follow through and end up, you know, making good money and really succeeding. And yeah. I, and I salute all those people and think, wow, I'm a total loser because I did not follow through <laughs> like, like you guys did. I think though, like, I mean, when I think of like the classic inventor, I think, you know, you think of Thomas Edison and Ben Franklin and they just sort of lived to, but business was very different in those days, as opposed to now, where if you have an idea for something and you, and you know, the steps, like you said, like it would have never have occurred to me, oh, I should find manufacturers in China to create my physical product. But, um, I mean, for people that have that inkling, they want to create a physical product and sell it. And they know that <clears throat> they feel, well, I guess you probably didn't realize that you didn't like the sales piece of it until after you made your product, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I, I love the, the solving of the initial problems like, yeah. oh, hey, what are we going to make this out of? Oh, hey, who are we going to have manufacture it? Oh, hey, let's build a website. All that, right. all the, the kind of tactical stuff. I love that. But then when it comes to actually going out and like, you know, like going to a trade show, I, I, I'm, I guess I'm kind of an introvert and I, those types of things or going, you know, I went to a couple of golf stores with my golf product, uh -huh. you know, and handed them my thing and told them about it. And, and I'd walk out just feeling dirty and, oh. um, and rejected. And yeah, <laughs> so, uh, so I would never make a good salesperson. So for people that are like that, for anyone that might be listening that thinks like, I have this great idea for a product. Um, I want to do what Matt did. So how would you recommend that people get started or like when you, when did you realize that the sales thing wasn't for you to where, if you were going to create a product, if you're going to start this all over again, to try to take everything from start to finish, um, what would, what kind of mindset, what kind of steps would you want to want to participate into so that would feel right for you I guess if somebody has a great idea for a product then they're like oh I don't know if I can take this for the long haul well for I mean a little self-examination goes a long way yeah. before you do stuff like this and there are and like I said you know a lot of people that I've talked to really start to thrive once they've got that product built mm -hmm. and so for them you know but for a lot of people, when they're first starting, they're like, well, where do I begin? You know, I don't right. even know how. And um, like for us, we didn't know who could manufacture this, this posture device. And we didn't yeah. know how to even get it done. But, but what I thought was, well, if someone can manufacture a belt, they can manufacture my product. Sure. So we went to Alibaba back in the early days of Alibaba. Yeah and looked up belt manufacturers in China and Vietnam. And that okay. was, that was what we did. So, oh, yeah. and then um, somebody on, on a YouTube video, someone talked about getting manufacturing samples. So I just said, Hey, here's a drawing and, mm -hmm. to these belt manufacturers. Here's a thing. I want you to make it out of neoprene instead of leather belts yeah. and, and send me a sample and, you know, let me know how much that would cost. And so it just, um, that's where I would start. It is like, you know, first of all, find out, kind of figure out how you're going to get it manufactured. Right. And, and then with the help of manufacturers, um, they can help you design it. And that was like a big eye opener for me is that, you know, I just kind of asked because I didn't know how to design it myself. And, and they were, they were, I mean, wow. literally the turnaround was like a couple of weeks from oh China. Gosh, that's incredible. Yeah. Now, did you have to go down the road of doing the patent? Did you have to get a patent for it and do all that? 
lost yeah that? yeah we did we we went through the provisional process and because okay. we wanted to have and and that essentially you can anyone can get a provisional patent it's like 120 or at least it was like 120 bucks it lasts you for a year and okay. so what we wanted to do when we knew that we were going to be on shark tank we applied for that provisional patent okay um because we wanted a, to to at least be able to say that we had done something, you right. know, like a normal business would have done. Yeah. And um, even though we knew that it would run out, we might not apply for the actual design patent. Um, but yes, that's what we that's what we did. And so you didn't apply for the design patent. We didn't. Yeah. Okay. Be because what we found, and this is another thing that I tell people and that may or may not be good advice, but people come and say, well, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to talk to the manufacturers because I don't want them to steal my idea or right. I don't want to go to the 3D printer guy to have him print a 3D prototype of mine because I want he might steal my idea yeah. or I don't want to tell my my cousin about this who's in the industry because he might steal and I yeah. and I tell these people product development is a gigantic long-term pain in the ass slash <laughs> commitment yeah and so therefore the chances of someone stealing your idea unless it's like uh, you know, uh, do you remember those, those finger spinners that came out a couple of years ago and people were like fidget spinners? Uh, oh, like, it, yeah. If you yeah. on your cuticles, you could do that instead. It, exactly. Yeah. I, I mean, that was something that was very easy to copy, but for anything, you know, that, that requires some kind of thought design and manufacture, the, the, the prospect of someone stealing your idea and actually running with it, the likelihood is generally pretty low. Just oh, okay. because it's it's very hard, yeah. To, you know, and if you have no passion for the idea, if you're just like, oh, hey, Dave was talking about a, you know, a new shower head. I'm going to steal that idea and go find a manufacturer, yeah. and build a website, and figure out how to rip him off. Uh, it generally, it doesn't <laughs> doesn't work that way. So I tell Not people, a lot of instant gratification at all. It's exactly. So I tell people to spend a little less time worrying about protecting your idea and spend a little bit more idea, more time, you know, working on developing the idea. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So if you could go back and do it all again, would you still go on Shark Tank and all of the things? Absolutely. Yes. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Because I mean, you cannot pay for that kind of uh, publicity and it's still it now our episode re airs every once in a while on uh, CNBC. Oh, cool. And so I'll wake up in the morning and all of a sudden grrr, there'll be a ton of sales. <laughs> And it's like, oh, we re-aired last night. Yeah, that's fun. So, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's sort of like um, if you ever, I guess for my friend Bryce was in a HBO movie way back in the day. And and so like he'll get a check for $1.30 every now and then if somebody else awesome. shows his movie. <laughs> Those types of fun little quirky things. Uh -huh. um, yeah. So then when, so the video production thing, how did how did that come to you? Was that sort of what you're collegiate training was or was that something that just kind of came out of well I did this in my day job so video production came naturally to me well um no I didn't study it in college I studied uh, economics in college um okay. but uh yeah I was working for in, in marketing doing marketing for a, a technology company and um I would hire videographers to do shoots and then I would have them kind of show me how to use the camera. Like, what are you doing here? You know, Got bring it. an extra camera. I'll run the third camera, you know, whatever. And so I kind of learned a little, but then in, in 2006, uh, in the spring of 2006, Google announced that it was going to buy YouTube uh -huh. for $1.65 billion. Right. And, I remember and this that. was, yeah. And, and back then $1.65 billion was a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Also, most of us didn't have broadband connections at home. Right. So we weren't watching videos at home. And, and if we were, we were watching, do you remember the real player? It was like about that big and it would be up in the corner of your screen. Yeah. Like 320 by 240 pixels. <laughs> yeah. And video was just not a thing that you could really consume well, especially yeah. from home. Right. And so it, it's the, as soon as that uh, um, announcement came out that Google was going to buy YouTube, I literally printed up a letter of resignation and I gave my boss 60 days notice. And I was like, dude, listen, video on the web is going to be the next big thing. Wow. I'm going to start a little one man video production company. I'm going to learn how to do this. And that's going to be my, uh, my thing. And that's so you, how you it happened. You took the leap before <laughs> you were necessarily replacing your full-time income. Yeah. And, wow. and so many people told me I was an idiot because 
I, I remember I had a kind of ex-girlfriend at the time and she's like, you know, I told my mom you were going to quit your job and she asked how many clients you have. And I, when I told her you don't have any, she was like, you're an idiot for quitting your job because you should, you know, spend the time to, to build some business first. And while I can see that, I had to, what's the phrase, the burn the boats, you know, it's like, yeah. I, I had to, because I knew that I'm, I mean, I'm, as you know, now I'm kind of a lazy person. Um, I <laughs> knowing myself, I was like, I've got to actually quit the job. And I have to depend on this yeah. as a, as a, as an enticement for me to actually get work. I think that's super impressive though, that you like that level of self-awareness, I think is pretty pretty rare and pretty special to know like the a that that's what like to see that foresight um i don't know that not everybody would pick up on that um and then b to say like i i know in my heart and my gut like i want to make this a, a gig for myself um and to then know like if i don't go all in i don't if i don't jump off the cliff now i'm still going to be standing there you know with two toes hanging off and Totally. You know, my, now hating my day job, which maybe you hadn't hated your day job yet. You were digging it, but like, it's, you know, you get that, that burn, that feeling like, oh, I really want to do this and I see how I can make it work. But I, yeah, I just think I'm, I'm really impressed to, to hear <laughs> that. Yeah. That, that you would have that conviction right away and know like, this is the, what I want to do. And this is how I have to make it successful. Um, I think that's really, that's super impressive. So yeah. Yay, well, Matt. <laughs> Um, what other side hustles have you, have you had along the way that you've kind of tinkered with besides the inventing stuff? Well, um, I have done the whole deal of buying, uh, closeouts at, uh, Walmart and selling it on Amazon, which okay. I, I mean, I mean, and now, I mean, Gary V he does these videos where he goes to garage sales. I don't know if yeah. you've seen those, but, um, I figured out, I saw somebody talking about selling on Amazon back like six or seven years ago. And I thought, well, I can do that. And I, mm -hmm. um, so I, I would go to like the Goodwill and buy textbooks and sell textbooks online, uh -huh. um, which is kind of easy money, or at least it was when colleges were in person. I don't know what they're doing for textbooks now. Well, there's so many rental things now, like, oh yeah, it's like Chegg and even Amazon has textbook rental. So, um, oh wow. Yeah. And, and I guess there's something called, is it called OED? I forget exactly what it's called, but it's basically open access. And a lot of faculty are trying to teach courses that allow students to utilize open access technology so wow. that they can get stuff for free. Um, I mean, it's definitely in that whole equity arena. Um, I don't know so much about it, but, um, but we, you know, we have a very thriving bookstore on our campus that sells books and, you know, campus apparel. Cause you know, right. we all need our mascot hoodie. <laughs> sure. Uh -huh. Um, but, uh, but I digress. I interrupted you. Um, nope. You're talking about selling on Amazon. Oh yeah. So, I mean, so I've sold everything you could possibly imagine selling on Amazon, uh, you know, uh, lawnmower blades, which by the way, it's expensive to ship lawnmower blades. I um, would imagine that that would be a tricky it, one. Yeah. 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 I, I've, I've known of people that have bought pallets from Amazon, which I guess are returned products uh -huh. that work just fine and you can turn them around. Um, I know, if, I know a few people that do that. Um, and I mean, I've, so, who hasn't sold something on eBay that they wore and didn't like, and right. tried to, you know, get money for it. There's so many, there's so many apps and, and things now for the clothing deal. Like you've got Poshmark, oh, yeah. you've got thread up, but I, none of those really feel like side hustles to me. Be, and I guess it's because they don't, I don't know if they 1099 you or not. Like, do you have to yeah, they'll give you, I mean, depending on um, how much money how much you make, you they'll give you a, a, like a, uh, there's a specific online 1099 called the 1099K. And so okay. that's for like e-commerce, um, yeah. which by the way, my idiot accountant uh, failed to file or failed to look or ask me for a 1099K from PayPal. Oh. And and so word to the wise, okay, so my idiot uh, accountant, and if you're listening to this, dude, I'm sorry, that's why you're not working for me anymore. But <laughs> so the 1099k just takes all the sales that you make, 
Yeah. And, and, and it doesn't take out all the fees and all the returns. So we went, and when we were on Shark Tank, we went from making, I don't know how much we had made the year before, maybe 50 grand. And then all of a sudden we went to like three or 400 or whatever. Wow. And so we had this, these gigantic 1099Ks that didn't take into account the returns and the fees and everything. So it would, right. it would say that you made a gross amount, but you only made a net amount. And so the IRS saw a, they saw the jump. So they thought we were drug dealers and B the, the numbers didn't line up with our 10 forties. So we got audited and they oh, put no. the hammer on us. Oh, and yeah. So anyway, word to the wise, yes, there's the 1099 K. And uh, if you sell a lot online, make sure that you go dig into PayPal, dig into eBay, dig into whatever and, and get that 1099 K and make sure that your uh, uh, accountant knows about it and reconciles it so that you, yeah. so that he knows the difference between the gross and the net numbers. So that's for selling physical goods. That's mm -hmm. not because I do mystery shopping as a, as a baby side hustle too. And it's, a, it's through a company and they, you know, send me to the grocery store and I, you know, put everything in my app and then they, they pay me through direct deposit. And I don't think I get a 1099 K, but I'm assuming that that's more like a gig economy. Yeah, that would thing. probably be a, that 1099. Uh, I don't know the number. What, what the same thing you would get if you were like an Uber driver. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's true. So just a normal 1099. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember what the. Yeah, I don't. What the, I don't remember either. But I know I, I get them. And and uh, my yeah. husband and I run a nonprofit swim team, and we pay coaches. So if they make, is it six hundred and fifty dollars? If they make more than six hundred and fifty dollars, we have to issue that. And yeah, thank you QuickBooks for doing that automatically. Yeah, uh -huh. Such a such a helpful thing. I know it's you know having a having a side hustle is not hard. It's not hard work. You have to work hard, but there are these little in, intricacies. In, in intricacies. Special, yeah, that. Um, yeah, the words are just not coming today. Um, <laughs> that you have to pay attention to. And I, I yep. mean, I learned something new today with the 1099 K thing. So if you're dabbling in the goods, if your side hustle is going to be buying pallets from Amazon or, or going to storage sheds and buying a storage shed and then repurposing those things, like, yeah, there's little details that you have to pay attention to. If you're saying like, this is how I'm making my money. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 you know, again, uh, as I always say, talk to your accountant about this stuff and talk to talk to your accountant before you really get too deep in the business, because yeah. even even if you, you know, you've got this idea, maybe you've sold a couple lawnmower blades on on uh, Amazon, <laughs> but it's worth kind of just going to them and saying, hey, you know, what, what should I be looking out for? Because not only are they going to say, well, hey, um, you know, you got to report this, report that, report this, but they also may be able to come up with some great write-offs for you. Yeah. You know, for instance, so like, true. like, are you tracking your miles when you're going to look for wiper blades or whatever? Um, yeah. Are you writing off your, uh, you know, your postage expenses? You know, there's, there's a million different things, uh, good things, and potentially bad things. Yeah. So having an accountant kind of advise you on this stuff yeah, is worth absolutely. worth That's paying paying their time for. Something that Heather and I talked about when she was when she was on my show, those types of things, like what to oh. what to look for when you're finding an accountant and the kinds of things you need to start paying attention to, because um, that that stuff can make or break your income taxes for sure. Absolutely. Um, okay, so before we go, just let's let's dig into a couple tips on if you are an entrepreneur or you are rocking the side hustle and um, you're thinking about your retirement or you haven't started thinking about your retirement yet. What are some things people that are are uh, working for themselves in any way, whether it's full time or as a side hustle, things that they should be thinking about to make sure that they're paying the right attention to that time where it's you know hanging up the work work and as my uncle would say, like becoming financially independent. <laughs> uh huh. Well, I mean, the first thing really that I tell people is if you are not saving for your retirement, which right. a lot of entrepreneurs aren't, a right. and a lot of entrepreneurs are, you know, there's a, a million different excuses. And I've got these lists of why entrepreneurs are bad at retirement planning. But, um, but if you're not making enough to pay yourself, if you're just getting by, yeah. then, then you have to have a side hustle and that's, mm -hmm. it's all, that's all there is to it. It's like either 
either give up and go back and get a job where it'll automatically take six to 10% out and have a match and all that stuff. Right. Or d- d- drive an Uber car or, or, or go to garage sales or do something to supplement that income and take that supplemental income and put it away. Got it. That's, that's the first thing. I mean, because, because again, I, I, I know that in my first year, I didn't put aside anything when I was, when I first, and I, and I had been kind of a, a very aggressive 401k contributor. Yeah. Then in my first year, I didn't put aside any because I was barely getting by. And right. then my accountant at tax time, she was like, okay, you owe X number of thousands of dollars. And I'm like, well, I don't have the money. And she's said, well, you owe that. One thing you could do is you could put six grand into an IRA and that's going to save you two grand in taxes. Oh, and wow. I'm like, wait a minute. Yeah. And she's like, it works just like a 401k. Yeah. It's tax deductible. You know, it basically, it reduces your net income. So you don't have to pay taxes on that. So instead of paying the, the IRS six grand, put two grand into an IRS and, and then, you know, you will have saved yourself or, or whatever, whatever the numbers were. But all of a sudden I realized, wait a minute, I can yeah. pay myself and I can save myself a lot in taxes. That's so cool. that's a huge, it's a huge thing for self-employed people. But using that, that IRA in particular, that specific kind of retirement fund, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, there's, there's, there's various types of IRAs. Um, okay. Like at the time, I think she put me into a SEP, which is a, a an IRA, kind of a self, not, not a self-directed, but a, a self-employed uh, IRA. So okay. I could put in, I can't remember what the limit was back then, but it was more than a traditional IRA, which at the time was like five or six grand maximum. And, um, but yeah, you, there are, are different IRAs and there's even self-directed IRAs. There are solo 401ks for entrepreneurs. Okay. Which are beautiful because, and not to get too deep into it, but that enables you, these solo 401ks enable you to basically uh, be the custodian of your own retirement account, meaning you don't have to have like, uh, you know, Schwab or E-Trade or whatever there yeah. you can. So, I mean, I've bought houses with my self, uh, with my solo 401k. Oh, wow. And yeah. You can buy gold, you can buy cryptocurrency, you can buy into apartment syndications. And that's one of the beautiful things about being self-employed is that you can kind of control and not because if you are in a, in a 401k, you can't, you know, you've got to buy the, these mutual, you get a, a menu right. of mutual funds, maybe some bonds, and that's it. Oh, yeah. Whereas if you're self-employed and you have one of these solo 401ks, you can invest in almost anything. anything with very, Yeah, which yeah. is very powerful. I have a 403B from my credit union at the college that I work from. And the page that when they send me the report, all the different things that they uh-huh. have my money in is it's like five pages and it's like little tiny print. <laughs> I, I get that I should understand this, but it's, you know, that's fine. Just is the number going up or is it going down every single month? Right, um, right. Oh my gosh, so much other stuff to talk about. Um, well, you'll have to, offline someday, you'll have to tell me about the apartment thing that you're doing because that that sounds interesting. Um, oh, it's fun. Or maybe we'll we'll get, do another show where we talk about the apartment thing as a, as a side hustle. Um, so cool. Yeah, Matt, this was fun. I learned a lot. Um, well, and you are quite a multifaceted dude. So <laughs> where can everybody find you, listen to your show or appropriately stalk you on social media when it's working? Okay. Well, oh yeah, that's funny. Yesterday we had the blackout. Oh my God. I, didn't even, I didn't even know about it until today. How um, many emails did you get saying... Don't rely on social media. Build your list. Blah blah blah. I mean, I, I didn't. I, like I I haven't read any. I see clearly. I've got my <laughs> head in the sand because I, a I didn't know that we had the blackout until this morning, and and b I haven't read any emails about. Uh, but but I'm sure I'm sure that freaked out like most of the nation. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Anyway, but well, where can we uh, find you? So I have a podcast called the Rogue Retirement Lounge, and that's R O G U E, and um, that is all about retirement planning for entrepreneurs. And awesome. we talk about everything from uh, alternative investing to longevity to uh, brain health and cryptocurrency. You name it. If it's related to retirement for yeah. entrepreneurs, it's on the Rogue Retirement Lounge, and uh, that's available anywhere you consume podcasts. Yes, and don't you also you do a clubhouse room with um, a couple I have of been. podcasts? Yes, yeah, with um, with uh, Daphne Jones and um, Heather Zeitwolf, 
And uh, we do that at three o'clock Pacific time on Thursdays, where we talk about money for Gen Xers. Yes. And I um, need to get on that. I need to listen to you guys because yeah, that's, I mean, I love all three of you and that just will be a really fun club to hang out in. So it, it is fun. And a lot of us Gen Xers kind of, we, we, we tend to I don't know, because I think we we have lived this very comfortable life, most of uh-huh. us, you know, raised in the 80s. It's like, you know, we were never hungry. And, and so we kind of take for granted the money thing. Yeah. And uh, so so as we Gen Xers have our own challenges. And that's what uh, we're we're talking about. Awesome. Gen, money for Gen Xers. I love it. Okay. Well, this is Matt Franklin from Rogue Retirement Lounge. And again, I'm your host, Chris McPeak. And this is the God Side Hustle Show. Thanks again for uh, downloading today's episode. And Matt, thank you for hanging out with us. Thank you, Chris.